Speak up, is this okay? Yeah, that's fine. Please, rather than, than this. Um, now, why am I talking about Polly Parrot? Growing. No, I'm asking, thank you for the, for the question, but that's not the answer. <laughs> He's retired on the Bushman's River. Now, if you travel, to Port Alfred or Kenton or Bushmans, and you pass through a town called Alexandria, tiny village. Um, and on the way there, on that particular route, and I was there just a couple of weeks ago, and I saw this again, but I didn't turn off. Because every time I turn off, I find, this is not the right story, I find a base community. <laughs> and I was told now, and I saw the sign, I had seen the sign before, there is a farm on that road called Base Flay. Not by coincidence. It's yet another property that our man, Queen Rather Base, uh, occupied and farmed for a while. Now if you travel from Uniondale to Willow Moor in the Karoos, you go over little poppies as they call them in the Karoo, and on the left, on the little ridge, you see a farm 
the signpost which says base good. Why? <laughs> Couldn't write the base form there for a while at one time or another. I can't keep up with this. Thing. <laughs> and this is my, why my book is not able complete. Clarks is out there, I was there and they're staring me at me and said, the people are here and you're talking about these people and there's no book. So I've stopped discovering uh, happening upon base communities all over the country. But that's the footprint. These farms are part of the footprint and we're going to follow this odyssey of Kunra the base today to give you some idea of this kind of impact that we had on our country and our history, our culture scape as anthropologists are like to talk about that. Yes sir? Do you, do you have the book that I'm not understanding? Is that book available? Or? No, it's not. And it hasn't been written yet? It, <laughs> I mean, it hasn't been completed yet? It's been written. Yeah. It's been it's written. In English. In English? Yeah. My kind of English? Yeah. <laughs> it might be intelligible. It is in the process. No, no, it's, it's now printers and uh, editors yeah. and illustrators and designers yeah. and no, it's an in, it's a nightmare kind of process, but the reason why it was delayed, I'm sharing with you this week, yeah. because I discovered on the Choritz another community, a community, not a farm, community of bases, significant presence in, in our South African uh, uh, Rainbow Nation, and on the long cliff I discovered different farm, not just one where Kunrad was, where his uncle was, where his one, one brother was, where etc, etc, and where he himself actually had farms and stayed there. In a sense, a farming community as well, so in a sense of, and it can never be complete, in a sense of um, better representation of the base phenomenon, I've now written those into this book. It could have been done by six months or eight months ago. Here's my excuse. And um, <laughs> you say you might bring up a uh, yeah. later edition as well. Yeah. So, thank you. It is available. Incidentally, Clark said to me just now, and I'm not allowed to do marketing, and I'm not doing marketing. Mm -hmm. They said, if you want to, to, if you're interested in this kind of story, speak to them at the table. Yes. If and when the book is, is, is on the shelf, they have it. They may be available. So they know all about it. And incidentally, not the book, not the book. <coughs> if you want to follow up, like that little story, at all, on anything base, please put your email or number or na and or name on this before we part on Friday, sadly. Okay? <coughs> Thank you. Like, uh, one of the things that interests me is that you can trace his history because he kept naming his farms or the farm with his name. Mm -hmm. Had he not done that, you would never have got what you've got. Yes and no. Okay. Um, if I can l list, let me guess, 11 properties that he's had or occupied over the years, three of them carry his name. The others are, are studying themselves to the opkomst and places like that. Uvrta, that and so on. Beautiful places and names. Ian Zame, loneliness in the middle of nowhere at that time. Well, even now, still, Ian Zame, that beautiful old, that was his uncle. But, um, no, not always. Okay. But, but, but a lot. And it says again something about this, this man this contradiction of the person. He was egocentric. The term wasn't applicable then, or used then, or even thought about, but this is, I think, if we retrospectively psychoanalyze, or try to psychoanalyze, it's a, a complex uh, person. And, and we find him in this, this physical shape that's, that's equally interesting. As I said yesterday, seven foot two, I mean, it's a big man at all. Now today I'm going to be a little bit pedantic because I want to follow this man around the country, not to every single farm, <coughs> to some of the places and areas that, that he happened to. <coughs> it's just, uh, and, and again somebody mentioned that red uh, something, you remember, uh, 
King of the Bastards that we spoke about yesterday in 1950 that was published. That was semi-fiction and semi-non-fiction, that book. And uh, some license were taken, was taken in writing it. Now, the Skuman, who is, that's a married name, 1938, actually did a thesis on Kunrad base at the time. And this is an excerpt from that. But listen to this. And she did, for that time, or even for now, that incredibly thorough research. And it's amazing what kind of sources she happened upon even then. And again, this, this is comment on what I said yesterday, that at first, when I started becoming interesting, interested in this man and these people, they said, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing available about him or them at all. You can go to the libraries and the archives and they can, we'll see how wrong that is and how wrong that was. He was a forerunner of a new type of South African, the stoically brave, fanatically independent tracker with his childlike faith in God's word. But like all new types, he possessed the traits of his successes in a more marked and more crude degree. In him, bravery was reckless daring. Independence was lawlessness. And his religion was a mess of inconsistencies. Now, yesterday, I, I gave you all those depictions, those terms of different writers, different sources who have been describing as a father, a, a gentle giant, an outlaw, or whatever the case may be. But what he did in his later life, and his one son, the second eldest by his wife Elizabeth, the Zulu niece of uh, uh, Ms. Lukatsi, was to tell him, and he actually read to them, and this Michael actually recorded and remembered once they were in Sopansburg, where I spent a lot of time. The son of his said that our father read to us from the Bible. And this Bible actually was available until very recently. It somehow just disappeared somewhere. And this led Michael, now listen to this, this is accurate statistic. This led Michael to retain one wife of the many wives and concubines that he had. How many did he have? 31. Three, one. So here's another side of this, this good one. We found in him, this is Liechtenstein, a certain modesty, a certain retiredness in his manner and conversation, a mildness and kindness in his looks and mien, the word I mentioned this day. You don't see that much in English than me and which left no room to suspect that he had lived years among the savages according to this story. Now I mentioned he was born in 1761 and this farm was Wagen Booms Rafir and Kochman Sloof near Montague. It's still there in that district. And as I explained, Kochmans to the Kochokwa, the Khoi people uh, of that area. In fact, the original inhabitants, if you exclude the sound of Bushmen. Maybe I should just spend 30 seconds on, on my use of terms. I might come back to Khoi Khoi, Khoi Khoi, and sound of Bushmen. President Cyril Ramaphosa just a few weeks ago signed off the first legislation in the history of this country that acknowledges or is di directed at the Khoi, this is now the title of thing, uh, the Traditional and Khoisan Leadership Act. First question, why traditional leaders and Khoisan Leadership Act. Why traditional and Khoisan? Why not traditional leadership act, which includes the Khoi and the so-called Song? Now, the term Khoisan, and I've interacted, I've corresponded, I've <coughs> met with uh, decision makers at every level, local, provincial, and national. Also, in Cape Town, about this term Khoisan. And I, I was then the last time I tried to do something about this, I was just recently back uh, in May last year from an international conference where linguists, paleontologists, archaeologists, uh, geneticists, and one anthropologist met 50 so-called experts from all over the world. And we discussed and, and, and uh, had a look at research around this term. Khoisan is a non-term. 
means chauvinistically a man without cattle. San means people without cattle. Koi is part of the word koi koi or koi koi, which means people or uh, men of men, chauvinistically. Nowadays we say let's call them eminent people, the koi koi. And you don't spell it K-H-O-I, you spell it K-H-O-E, K-H-O-E-N. Not koi koi, koi koi. Eminent people. Been here in this country for 2,000 years. Confirmed by the archaeologists, confirmed by the paleontologists, confirmed by the linguists, confirmed by the geneticists, and happily affirmed by the anthropologists in terms of other kinds of soft research. Sun is not a term that the Bushmen ever, ever used for themselves. It's a term that the Khoen Khoen, derogatory term that they used to be called by Van Riebeck and then the Hottentots, used by them for the Bushmen. Because the Bushmen had no cattle, and because they had no cattle, they say, the Khoi say, they stole our cattle. And they people without cattle. It means San means people without cattle. Every community, descendants of Bushmen, that I've worked with, every single one, without exception, say, what's this Bushmans? Look, what's this funny Gil Mensen? We are the yellow people. Son, you ever heard of son? What does son mean? It's not us. It's been enshrined in legislation, traditional and poison leadership act. First prize for Bushmen is perhaps not Bushmen. If I'm talking about Bushmen descendants in the Karoo, I say Tom. Northwest corner of South Africa, Kung, or Tonsil their own term for their own particular community, first prize. So in this thing went there where it was uh, lightning and thunderstorms and all sorts of crackling, dangerous sort of sounds. That's where Kunrad was born, 1761. And then we move along. Two to Cape Town, he was baptized. Uh, Esel Yacht in the Boer Langkloof, where he spent time. So we go three, four, five, go up the coast into Kosa land, Zulu land, up into Sutu speaking areas, Swana speaking areas, eventually in Venda speaking areas. And I have another map that's upcoming that I indicate these, these traditional black communities, South Africa, and wherever they live. Now, the Venda part, right in the northeast corner of South Africa, that's where Skumansdal, that foot tracker village, was established. And it's only a few kilometers away from where, where Baystor was finally, where they settled now, where land. 
So the interaction with the vendor is more recent and much more significant than any of the others. And just incidentally, the vendor as a community, and they self-identify, they have a language uh, vendor, uh, I, mean, I won't use the whole term for it, just with reference to COSA, not EC COSA, but COSA or vendor. Uh, that is also the community, uh, incidentally, another terminal, terminological thing. Uh, the use of tribe is now taboo. Uh, it's not used, so we talk about these different communities. who self-identify as being, this is who we are. This is where our president comes from. Cyril uh, Ramaphosa is a vendor by origin, and he's quite proud of that. But it's also the smallest ethnic community or group in the country, by far, as opposed to the Zulu probably the most numerous. Okay, here we go. They remarried, okay, his father died already in 1769. Remember, he was only born, he was born in, in 61. Uh, so he was nine years old when his father died, but his mother had remarried. So now we carry on with this chronology. I think I've sorted it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Just before this, we discussed technology and different generations and, and so on. I've just proved the point. I actually can. <laughs> okay. So, um, I must go back to the previous one. Yes, I can. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, at age 21, this is now 1782, he decided to move to his half sister's farm in, in the Sunderland district. So our map will take us to four. You know roughly where so I'm going here. We will go back to the map just so we, we follow this route or this odyssey, uh, this epic life journey. You know. He worked there as a foreman, but they had an argument about butter. And because he was working there without payment, he would get a share of their butter that they, they produced for the nearby towns and so on. He even went to court. So he left them. There was bad blood between them. And he went to his own loan farm there. The Braca Refier on the Lange Kloof and over the Attequas Kloof. Now Attequas Kloof is the Robinson Pass that you will go over if you, if you move from Mossel Bay in the direction of Oatsville. It's a beautiful pass you go over there, but that's actually still the, 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 the area is called Attequas Kloof. And that incident is a Khoi Khoi uh, uh, community that used to live there, Attequa. And that means, ironically, the white people, Attequa, people of the white, white people. And Otoniqua, those mountains, incidentally, is also a Khoi word, or Khoi Khoi word. Otoniqua means people of the honey, because they carried on their shoulders honey from inland to where George is now today, to the communities living there at the time. So that's where, uh, we are now at number five. We'll pick up on that mattress now. And he took his stook, you see the uh, inverted commas there, uh, the wife of local Maria van der Horst. As I said, euphemistically, van der Kop, because she was um, a local, probably of mixed descent, maybe partly slave, almost certainly partly Khoin Khoin, of the local people in that area. Chanokwa, the people in and around here, Cape Town, amongst others, uh, first lived here, 2,000 years ago. By 1784, it moved to another land farm, in the Grafrenet. See where we're moving now, we're in the middle of the Karoo. This is still our man, Kunrad. A land farm called Brandwacht on the Bushman's River. Now, Bushman's River doesn't sound like Grafrenet, but remember those, those districts were large. If you talk about Swellendam district, you could talk about 300, 400 kilometers away that the farm is still in the Swellendam district in those days. Ditto Grafrenet and the Bushman's River that we spoke about just now, it's Eastern Cape, but it's under the jurisdiction, was under the jurisdiction of the Grafrenet. Uh, yeah. Okay, and on the Bushman's River, so he became, yeah, he became involved in illegal bar barter with the Tosa. He forged names on anti-government petitions, reneged on paying rent for his farms. Now we're at point number six, you're moving up the coast, we'll see just now. Did he leave his uh, wife behind? Did he get new wives in new locations? He took Maria with him. 
even when he first cohabited, and I'm running ahead of my story, but with Kika, Kosa, uh, Kika's mother, Kika was a very young chief, so married. And eventually, even with, and she became known as Lindbergh, Miss Lakatsi's niece or sister, the sources are a little bit doubtful about whether, but she was related to Miss Lakatsi. At that stage, Maria van Oost was still with him. And the other wives accepted it because uh, polygynous marriage or uh, the system was, was common in amongst the Kosa and amongst the Zulu. It wasn't strange for him to, to have more than one uh, partner, as it were. He clashed with this magistrate of the because he refused to take part in the Second Frontier War, which is a rather strange statement because directly or indirectly, and we'll see that now, he was involved in some sort of way in all those frontier wars. And there were several, I think seven and <coughs> more at that time. It used to be called the K-Wars, the derogatory term at that time. Okay, but in, now in 89, 1789, obtained two more loan farms, the Driefontein and Boschfontein. But again, he reneged on the tables. When the Cape came under British rule in 1795, you see what he had to deal with. First the Dutch, then the British, then the Batavian Republic, also Dutch, but from the east. Uh, the base gained considerable status amongst the burghers for his anti-government sentiments and for acting as mediator between them and Kossa the on the eastern frontier. The main, main incident, the magistrate was suppressed, uh, perhaps indirectly due to in Kunrod's uh, activities. For the next six years, he was an outcast and a vagabond as he was setting the Tosa on the colonial side of the fish river against the government. In 1798, Governor McCarthy put a reward of 100 Rix dollars. It used to be the Netherlands uh, Dutch currency, Rix dollar. I tried to convert that into contemporary uh, currency, but found it difficult, impossible. But it was a lot of money for, at that time. And look at this, on his head, dead or alive. 1799, we move on now, and this is number seven on our map that we look at now. The base went into exile across the Fish River, befriended and stayed with Ngeka and his people, briefly back in the Cape Colony to play the leading role in Van Yarsveld's rebellion to overthrow the British administration. A lot of roles, a lot of interests. You can have a look, this is not such a clear map, but it just indicates uh, all the movements in that direction. And this was sort of uh, the general, the red arrows, the general migration of colonial farmers at that stage. So it wasn't strange for uh, Kunrat as well. There were other farmers, he was ahead of some of them sometimes, but he was with them sometimes and sometimes followed them. They were moving into the interior as well and certainly up the west coast. And of course there was friction, there was interaction between the local people, uh, although initially some of the chiefs of these communities would, uh, because of uh, hunting privileges or whatever those colonial farmers could uh, offer them, they would at least accommodate them, if not give them land to live on with the farm. But friction uh, developed in almost every case at that time. And at the forefront of such was our man. Then he went for a while to live amongst the Tembu people. That's further up the coast. You'll we'll see the map now. Um, <coughs> so the East Tembu is in there. This uh, our last president, uh, not our last president, a previous president, uh, Mandiba, Mandela's people in that area. <coughs> That's towards the east. And gathered a band of British deserters around him. Now, there's sorts of people all over the place, all over the country at the time, by now. Directly or indirectly, he was involved in the first three frontier wars, as I said just now, and that's in the Zierfeld, that's near Grangetown and beyond that we're talking about. And this involved different Kossa factions. They even, even um, initiated this, this opposition between the people themselves because of taking sides or whatever the case may be. At this time, and there's a picture of him, the base met and befriended from the camp of the London Missionary Society. And he acted as his interpreter and mediator with Ngrika, his people. There is Ngrika, 
Now we're back to a question and discussion we had yesterday about depiction of people. This is a sketch as well. There are a number of sketches done by different people about Mecca as well. Um, he was the grandson uh, of Chachabe, a very influential and senior chief at the time. Uh, and he followed in his father's footsteps and was equally influential at the time. But yes, Kudrat, and he takes, and I use the word advisedly, the young chief Kika's mother as his wife. So no, the, this person now joined uh, Maria. He had different concubines at that time. There was nothing formal about some of the other relations at all. Due to escalating violence, Kumrad and Van der Kemp moved to Tarka. Now we're back in the Karoo area. Some of this near Queenstown, if you don't know Tarka, <coughs> that area. Um, and this trek was in, in, in interesting in itself. This was in, at, on 1800. And it worked out very nicely how many years ago that was. The trek taking four months and involving 59 people, a cart, three wagons, 25 horses, and 300 cattle. <coughs> okay, now this gives an idea of the, the communities as you move up the, the east coast. You can start over here with Kosa and Pondo and the different uh, clans, if you like, or communities of the Zulu, not least of which the Kumalu, and we'll talk about them. They became known as the Ndebele, or Matabele on the Mislikazi. Incredibly, incredibly influential individual in the history of our country as well. And with Kudrad now in the mix, imagine this interaction between them and the effect that they had on different parts of, of this country. Okay, right up to the north, you can see we mentioned right up to uh, what is now Botswana, the Pedi, the Venda, right up there. Uh, the West Coast is almost the only part of, the, geographically speaking, the only part of this country that, that didn't seem to touch Kunra. I don't understand. All right, the journey continues. With the Cape coming under the rule of the Batavian Republic, now we're back in 1803, the new governor, Janssens, requested a basis of in the peace negotiations with the Kosa. He also mentioned as, mentioned as far as Zulu land to, to the territory of Kumala and the chief Muscasi, as I said, and these people became known as the Matabele. And he was this leader to feature prominently in events, interaction, confrontation, skirmishes with people further north and eventually to establish a kingdom in what was to become Rhodesia, Zimbabwe. Two big uh, ethnic groups you like, Zimbabwe of today as well, the Shona people, and then the Ndebele people, those are the two. Kunrad befriended Ms. Lakazi's sister, who became known as Elizabeth. And this is the significant partner, concubine, or wife uh, of all of, of the females that he interacted with in his entire career. They eventually formally married. And this was a phase that I might call the Bible reading or Bible discovery phase of Kunrad's life and he thought he should get married properly, which he did in Solendam in 1812. Well, literally in Solendam, not in the district, in the town at the time, 1812. And they had eight children, uh, and the significant sons from that marriage were Gabriel, Michael. Interesting where the word, a name like Michael comes from in those, during those days. You uh, wonder about that. And Dora Sotuas. And they played such an important part in the racial developments in the South Transburg area. So there's our map again. You can see we've moved through most of these parts and we're moving now to the, to the north. You can see number 10 is coming up. Uh, when Janssen's granted uh, the base amnesty, he settled on the farm. The Opkomst, as I said, that's in the long cliff, very close to the town of Oatsworn today. And where his brother had previously found, there's number 10 up here, and he was there in 43 years of Moscuna. Commissioner de Mist visited him there to welcome him back to the country of his birth. Lichtenstein, who traversed the colony in the early 1800s, 1800s accompanied de Mist and was <coughs> indicated, described Kunrad as follows. Let's share this one. 
is uncommon height. We started talking about this yesterday. For he measured nearly seven feet. In fact, he was by some commentators taller than that. The strength, yet admirable proportion of his limbs, his excellent carriage, his firm countenance, his high forehead, his whole mien, and a certain dignity in his movements made altogether the most pleasing impression. Here we come. He seemed the living figure of a Hercules, the terror of his enemies, the hope and support of his friends. What an enigma, what a contradiction, what a fascinating personality. The Odyssey continues. That spelling on Nanwa, you actually pronounce Khananwa. As you travel north, not on the N1, between Polokwane and Petersburg to the little town of Beaver, you'll see a, a massive mountain on, on the left. It's called Blauberg. Within the distance and even closer, it's blue. Blauberg, blue mountain. And the top of that very large mountain lives the entire community, the Khananwa. And their chief at the time was Malaboch. And of course, uh, Kunrad not only interacted with them, he actually was allowed to stay with them, put up house as it were with his wives there, and became a kind of headman under Malaboch at that time. He even was given an honorary t uh, name, Kadisha. Now I, I tried, through linguists as well, tried to find out exactly what this means. Uh, the closest we can get is Kadisha. Uh, was that kind of nickname almost meant? The Great One. And then Mokwasele, also a Tswana chief. Chief Khari of the Bamanguato, that's in present day Botswana. At first it was Bechuana land. Before, at this time, it wasn't even Bechuana land yet. And then the Odyssey was eventually to draw to a close. From this area, and this is just to the west of the Sopansberg that we're talking about, Blauberg is just to the west. We move a few kilometers, at, incidentally, at the, at the extremity of the western Sopansberg. If you just move around that last part of the Sopansberg, there are salt pans, extensive salt pans. And the bases actually exploited those salt pans at that time of Kunras to the extent they could export, export internally, but also export to Portuguese East Africa, which is now Mozambique, significantly at that time. Nowadays, none of them even, I think, work there. Maybe one or two youngsters work as laborers there, but uh, the salt pans, in a sense, now belongs to a, a, a company that, uh, that does the salt. It's still there, it's still being exploited. No end to the salt, right there. Anyway, they, they spent some time, the Kunrad and his sons and their families there, then they moved east to the Sopansberg proper again, close to where they ended up, his sons at least ended up. But he had one last plan, one last journey in mind that Kunrad said to his sons, and the two of them, only two of them and their families went with the Samuel and Michael, said, we're going to move north. And we think, and the sources suggest that he was intending to find a route to the east coast somewhere. So they moved along the Limpopo River up to a point. But at that point, incidentally by now, some of these wives had been left behind somewhere. Mm -hmm. It's not recorded how or why. But Elizabeth was still with him, Miss Lakatsi's niece or sister, the Zulu woman, Zulu Morris. And she died, the sources say, of fever. Not only sources, Michael actually wrote on that son actually kept a record, which was very, very useful for us, of course, at that time they started recording things themselves. Died of fever, malaria, probably, while they were on the river. And he was grief-stricken. And this Kunrad of ours, he was, I think, just turning 70 at that stage. Had gone semi-lame in the one side. He couldn't hunt his passion, he couldn't hunt properly, he couldn't hold the rifle properly, etc. And when his wife died, he was absolutely, says, perhaps in Dutch, Michael, grief-stricken, wasn't the same person. And on a certain day, at this spot, um, he asked his sons to come. They just had little shelters, temporary shelter, overnight shelters next to them. They said, just come and sit down and talk to you. He said, I want you to stay here. <coughs> I'm just going to explore a little bit further. Uh, don't go away. Just wait for me. 
and he walked off with difficulty on that particular day, early that morning, and he was never seen again. Now, speculation. Maybe the fever, malaria got to him soon after that. Maybe because of his condition, he, he just didn't make it. Lions, other predators, maybe. But a nice story. Yes, he continued on his journey and got as far as Sofala on the East Coast. And married again, a Genoese girl, and had children by her and established another community in East Africa. Speculative, but the present basis say their grandfathers, and it's confirmed by different individuals in the community today, were absolutely fascinated one day when two women, not local women, clearly for them by their appearance, and they couldn't communicate properly because they spoke Portuguese, and they said, they just come from the East Coast and they were visiting this particular area and they were just wondering where their great-grandfather came from. The, reason. the end of Kuno and the That story, but not his impact. So that was in 1821. That was the last trek. We now have number 16. We now in this, this particular area. Now the numbers take over the family, the sons, in terms of their movements and stuff. Let's just follow that quickly. I've never seen it. Those are the stories, some of them. We'll discuss this just now. There are bases in, in very interesting other areas of not only this continent, but elsewhere. We'll get to that now. Now his descendants, those two sons, particularly number 17, settled in the Sopanfer, but briefly returned to Botswana because of friction in that area. Lived for a while, a number of years in fact, to that Skumansdal that we saw, and we're going to revisit in a little bit more detail, number 19, that foot tracker village. They, they, they were guides and interpreters and assisted them in very many ways. And then they had wants to flee down to Baiskop. Remember our yesterday's story of the Gabriel and the bases on top of Baiskop and the Slakatsi's uh, people around waiting for them to come down. And they never ran out of liquids, not water. Um, and eventually abandoned that. So down to Baiskop, number 20, our map just now again. And to down to Urugsta, almost in the Roofveld. And eventually took a delegation uh, to Pretoria, to President Paul Kruger, uh, under leadership of Michael, just uh, a year or so before his death as well. And finally they settled 23 in base Lord, uh, right up against the uh, Serpentsburg. Now just to wrap up the base story in broad terms, the record indicates the following communities, young boys of base, there are some of his descendants in West Africa. It's been able to trace them. Certainly in Rhodesia, today Zimbabwe. In fact, a few of the present-day bases have returned from the, when South Africa became um, democratic in 1994. Some of the bases were left for various reasons, a legislative discrimination amongst others, went to Zimbabwe, just went across the river to Zimbabwe. After 94, some of them came back from Zimbabwe. And there's a significant number of them now back in base for several there again, uh, having been in the neighboring country. And then there are so-called white bases who play an important role in early Namibian history. It's a very clear record. We picked up on that. And imagine if I have to start building all of these things into a book, then we'll talk about 2025 for publication of this complete story. And then I, I filled in my car, I don't know why I was traveling through Coffee Fontaine. I don't know if anybody has ever been to Coffee Fontaine or even heard of Coffee Fontaine in the middle of the Free State. Uh, peculiar about Coffee Fontaine, incidentally, the railway line, line runs down through the main street, runs through the main street. Um, and I, I always chat to people wherever I come and I said, uh, what's your name? He said, uh, Johan. I said, your surname? Boys, I said no. 
I said, uh, where do you come from? He said, I come from here. I said, are there other, with your brothers in there? Yes, we are a community of about 40 or 50 people. Basis of in Coffee Fontaine. And yes, we know that. His path runs through Coffee Fontaine in most others. He didn't stay there very long, but clearly he stayed there long enough. <laughs> <laughs> and then, of course, the Southern Cape that I mentioned before. Now, look at those little indications that's played past on the Gouders River that I mentioned before. We're going to just have a close look at that. The opkomst in the long turf that I mentioned, where he farmed again. And then, of course, his uncle, Aquibus, who built this wonderful place, Ian Zamek, which is in. That's uh, Oatswan, as, as you travel to Union Day, Ian Sanmet is right there. Okay, just run through it. I brought some extra copies of this, incidentally. You can follow that from Jean de Bois at the beginning, Conrad de Beis, and his brother Friedrich, who's on the Gouders communities on the Gouders River. And that's his uncle over there, the blue, who uh, built that wonderful house at that time. I think that's for you, sir. No so I first, I said, I traveled the N2 as I did the day before yesterday, and there it says Base Plus, and I found this place, it's marked on the map, Base Plus, um, and there you can see on the Gouders River when it still had water, and just this morning, so then there are communications saying, and the, the, the closest significant little town to, to Base Plus on the Gouders River is Herbenstadt, and they were dependent on boils until a week or two ago, those who got Riverside has no water, and the water in the Gowards is not available. What is there is uh, tiny little muddy pools, and they, it's not portable, not useful at all. There's a, a crisis. I do have boreholes in in base class, but it's a massive. And tankers are now coming from from Mossel Bay. They fall in the Mossel Bay district, and people now have to fill up containers and take that. That's all they've had had now for a week or two already. So it's a big crisis. Not only there, as you know, but in the rest of the country. Crawford is, is, is a horror story in terms of drought and that at the moment. Amazing. I'm still impressed and more impressed every day by our archival record and the way that it's been kept and the, the, the accessibility of it. Here I found the death notice of Kugner's brother Fielder, who found and eventually established that community in the service. He was baptized in 1768 in the Cape and he died in 1838. He married formerly, a wife, but couldn't write like. He also had children by one Tarantal, descendant of Hesekwa uh, and other people in that area. And he had two sons by this other woman, uh, Sim and Saul, like in Samson and Saul, from the biblical Sim and Saul. And he left them a piece of land, these other children of his, by the Storm Valley. And uh, that's where this community was established, just 94.4 uh, hectares in extent. But there's a connection. But uh, again, just by happening to turn off the stuff. That's just showing that how they descend from uh, the original down to Friedrich and, and the present uh, people. So that's it. <coughs> then we have a slave class. Tarantal, those two sons, the Queen's Place class, we have that. Simpson, or Samson, if you like, eventually became a son of other, had six children. Found the so original title deed from the archives here in Cape Town of that property. Buffalo's Drift was the original name of that farm. Now the place is called Place. Class. That's that I mentioned yesterday. That is a settlement on the Gouritz. They use the three terms for the upper, the middle, and the lower part of Base Plus. Westad, by the fanciful upper city, or upper town, I suppose, middle stad and understad. That's the river now dry, totally dry. This is how they sustain themselves. We discussed this kind of thing yesterday on the left. Aloe, sap tapping, not at all anymore. Sun disease has taken to the aloes in that entire area and they cannot tap any sap anymore. So uh, again, <coughs> as the case in Bristol, they're dependent on pension, on the pension people and disability grants, etc., etc., and handouts in terms of whatever level of government. 
graveyard, the more recent and the very old, dates back to all those years. One of the early types of houses, it's changed now. Houses have improved, and we look at this a little bit in base talk as well from a very original uh, wattle and daub type of structures that they built to it. One of the fancy houses that they, they can afford nowadays in base talk, not so much down here in base glass. Okay, in the cemetery or the graveyard, uh, there is the church, very significant place there and in base talk always, some of the local people. Uh, Raleigh Philander in the middle there, the bottom left, is a very influential individual there. Uh, born, based, married to a Philander, and I managed to give her a number of Joyce Philander up in Baystorp. And as I said yesterday, Kunrad found Kunrad, and they discovered each other. And Raleigh found the other Philander who was also born in base, but happened to have married a Philander as well, but living in the two towns, and they knew nothing about each other until just a few years ago. Amazing stuff. Okay, now the Longclaw of people, the uncle of, of Kudrats, and they farmed in Longclaw. Let's just go through some of those farms that they owned and farmed in that area. Okay, the Opkoms, Belbedach, both of these over the Patakwa, that Robertson passed from Muscle Bay to Oosoran. Uh, Esel Yacht, Riet Keil, Diepe Kloof, on the Kamanasi, that's a river that flows through the long cliff around almost to, to Oswald, the Kamanasi River. All of these farms had some or other dwelling on them. But Ian Zamet, concealed there, obtained by Kudrat's uncle the Octobers in 1762, he built the house. And it's regarded as one of the earliest permanent buildings, 1766, in the long cliff, and also as vernacular architecture. Amazing place, still there, still to be seen. The owner is, well, it's about the fourth, sixth, seventh owner now, doesn't live in it anymore, but he's got people living in it, and it has been restored, although a colleague of mine, in reporting back and asking, you've been traveling out London, did you pop in to see inside, <coughs> and, spoke to him, and he says yes, uh, and he was rather disappointed, it's rather dilapidated now, at the moment, but there we go. The last, for those of you uh, interested in design and spaces and so on. For that time, look at the, the spaces, look at the, what the, uh, the people did in those days, and it's still there, exactly the same. One or two spaces uh, were added subsequently, but basically that house is still as it was at that time. Another base imprint or footprint, if you like. And we um, carry on tomorrow. We're back in Baystor tomorrow, back in Makada in the Trichard area, back at Skumansdal, and we'll meet up with the missionaries that eventually came, thanks to Michael, having left 30 of his wives. He then thought it fit to now have the missionary come and have a look at his situation and his context. Uh, significant story around the missionaries, incidentally, we'll get to that. Um, and interaction with the black communities, particularly Makaro, great chief of the of the Benda uh, people, and the British, and the Anglo Boer War, and concentration camp, etc. Next exciting episode <laughs> in the same place, same time. Any questions, please? Uh, let's just go back to Let's just see. Because he, he obtained the form earlier and then uh, 1766. He obtained the form in 62, house 66, 1766. Yes. You mentioned uh, loan farms. So who was the owner of those farms? Was it the government? The government. Yeah. You had to pay rent in a sense. That was a loan farm. You didn't get uh, to own the farm. So on a monthly basis, you have to pay a certain amount. And, and then you would own it eventually, like high purchase? Depending on the successful the success of your farming, yes, people then eventually. Oh, but it wasn't, uh, sorry, yeah, it wasn't it wasn't the way at that time. Because, uh, as I said, some farmers then moved off, you know, on their own and just occupied certain land because of the system at the stage. What the government in the Cape Wanda was to 
have control over the people and the force, and didn't uh, actually uh, encourage property rights as such at 